So good day and welcome to the Topco Business Unusual podcast. Today I'm joined by, is it professor or doctor? Doctor, professor, professor Glenda doctor, Gray. Glenda, yeah. Both, I think both. Eh? Right. So she, she, you're the, the, the president and CEO of the South African Medical Research Council. But you also, I've got all my notes here somewhere, um, but, but you also have um, a very strong medical background in terms I'm a of your research professor. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a research professor in pediatrics and I do HIV vaccine research and, um, and other kinds of reproductive health in women and issues around social science and women and HIV acquisition. It's a kind of um, both clinical research and social science work to try and understand some of the risk factors that give women HIV in South Africa. Mm, and we had some big problems. And I know for your work, you were recognized by Time magazine as one of the top 100 most influential people in the world. And Forbes as one of the top 50 most influential people in, in Africa. And I often thought because I saw you on the cover and I know that we put you on our cover for Top Woman and you spoke at the event. And uh, I thought, how do people find out about your good work? It's, I thought that was really amazing what you're doing and why, because we focus a lot on business as an organization. We focus on business leaders, leadership, and people making an impact. But I was really grateful that we can go into the scientific community and really, you know, start giving credibility and recognizing people making contributions in science and academia. Um, I, I, I look at things slightly differently. I, I see that business startups, entrepreneurs, policymakers, and academia need to come together more often and, and need to be talking and solving our big issues. And I, and I often feel that we clump ourselves into each one of those things that we feel most comfortable in. Do you, do you see that? Well, I think science is entre entrepreneurial as well. You know, so if I think of the work that we do in science, um, you have to innovate. And so when we're thinking of a science, of a science project or a science idea, um, you know, you have to come up with a, a really innovative um, hypothesis and then you have to get someone to fund it. So you have to <laughs> convince the funders, hey, this is good enough, give me money to do my research. And so uh, we call ourselves entrepreneurs as well because we basically uh, do research and um, you have to pitch your research project to a funder. And, um, and in this way, you, you become quite innovative because you have to be um, ahead of the pack. You have, to be, um, you have to have good ideas and you have to be aggressive in, 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 um, in showing why your idea is robust. So in fact, we're more related than you think. Um, you know, and so, and, um, there's, you know, so a lot of people, so a lot of people in South Africa who are, are scientists actually um, live on what we call soft money. They, they go from project to project and they write grants to bring money in to conduct that research. And that keeps you hungry. It keeps you on the edge and it keeps you innovative. You know, it, you know it's, if you just have a permanent job and, um, you know, and you don't have to worry about where your next paycheck comes from, uh, you might get soft. And so um, mm -hmm. uh, scientists are hungry because they, they have to write grants to bring in with money to, to, to conduct research. And, and South African scientists are actually quite innovative. In, in one of the programs that, that I run at the Perinatal HIV Research Unit at, at, in Soweto, we write grants to, to employ about 600 people. So we bring in about 120 million rand a year just in a little project in Soweto. Uh, and we've been employing people since 1996. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so we've managed to keep this, you know, and then um, and that's just one of the, those um, innovations. We have a whole lot across the country, people um, employing people in Kailiche, Orange Farm, um, in, um, in KwaZulu Natal, Ladysmith, who just go from grant to grant and employ 100, 120 people get involved in HIV vaccine research, get involved in COVID research. So wherever there's an opportunity, they position themselves so that they can, can conduct research. So, so in a way, we've, we're, more, we're as similar as you. We're as hungry and passionate and yeah. eager to, to change the world as you are. I'm seeing a lot more now as well in business, certainly, is that there seems to be a, a, a far bigger alliance 
on academic research in deciding policy within companies, best practice, people practices, even human capital. You know, I think there's been a lot of research around things like, you know, in recruitment, not just recruiting people for their IQ, but more around adaptability now. Which is yeah, you do. You need social scientists. So a lot of people bring in anthropology, anthropologists into the workplace to, to watch how, you know, first of all, to look at their, their climate, the organizational climate, your values, and also to see how people work together. So if you work in a team, you need to know, you need to know your team. So I use the Enneagram and we, um, and if you've heard what of are Enneagram, you? I'm what an eight. Are you? Are eight. you? Oh, wow. Yes. Powerful. Power, power in the uh, room. Huh? Power. So yeah, so, so basically, and then it's also, Oh, you're three. Oh, you're, you're, you're good. I mean, so I have a bit of a, a wing of a three. Um, I in me. Yes. You know, it's, and that's about helping people. Uh, you know, that part of the, the, the three years. If I'm healthy, about... if I'm healthy, I'm helping people. If I'm not healthy, <laughs> I've got the nice cars and the, and the nice yeah, seats. Yeah. Well, if, if I'm not, if I'm, if I'm bad, then I'm a mafia, you know, so the eighth goes from the mafia. <laughs> oh, yeah. Donald Trump's also an eight. I, but so I heard, I heard that about you. The government said that about you. <laughs> So my, Mandela was an eight as well and Mother Teresa. So I, I can aspire to, oh, really? to those people. So yeah, so we have the mafia bosses, we have Donald Trump, we have Glenda Gray, we have uh, Nelson Mandela, and then we have Mother Teresa. <laughs> so I'm kind of like, you know, so I, I, I have a lot of work to do. I'm work in progress. So I think threes are a lot of, I think they said that half the Fortune 500 CEOs are threes. That's amazing. So they're very goal orientated. So I do triathlons and I, and I, and I went like, I just started doing these triathlons like five years ago and I won SA champs four years in a row. And I came fifth at worlds from never doing them. And yeah. Is Richard Branson a three as well? Probably. Yeah. Okay. So we, we very goal orientated. Um, I don't know. Winning is part of our day. We're competitive. I think that's what it is. We're competitive. So the, the Enneagram's funny. We did it for our whole, yeah. our whole team. We could laugh at each other. I think that's what it made us do more than anything it else. Helps. And it helps you because particularly if you have, a, you have a counterphobic six on your, on your team. And you What's can always a counterphobic like... six? Because my wife and my brother are both sixes and they're the, my two other directors. Well, sixes are interesting. And in fact, they say more sixes should be leaders and more sixes should be presidents. But they, they mm. kind of, they're very evidence-based. And so they, they much, they, mm. they want to see the evidence before they act. But at the same time, they're also the kind of people who um, don't want to, who won't sail until the they ship is complete. And they also they're like, they, they don't want to leave, they don't want to leave the harbor. Yeah. They, they, but they can be a little bit catatonic at times. You know, they, they, they're, they're not, they're not risk takers. Yeah. And, um, but That's they, but they, they but they like evidence, you know, and so they would, they, they, they feel comfortable when they have evidence and they're great leaders, in fact, because they, they, they base their decisions on, on, on evidence. And, um, but they can also be very scared to, to, to move forward and catatonic. Mm. So you need to kind of shut them out of the nest a bit. Oh, that's what I do. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> they're, very, they're very good at evaluating people and working with people. I noticed that as well. So they say that they'll be your best friend for life. It's true. I've been married for over 20 years. I don't know how anyone else would do it, but she did. <laughs> Loyal. She has but, evidence and, that, you're, that you're good. <laughs> and yeah, indirectly, yeah, you could say that. So, so um, and I think that what we're getting is this science is helping us become better leaders, but not everybody's using the evidence like they should, right? This is the challenge now that we face. Yeah. And, the ch and in this, in COVID-19, the evidence changes all the time. And so yeah. you, you have to um, be prepared to reevaluate uh, your decisions based on evidence as it evolves. And what seemed like a good idea in March now seems like an atrocious idea. And yeah. as, as evidence, um, you know, uh, accumulates, you know, it was only in, I think it was in May that uh, we started this data came on about wearing uh, masks and the public started to wear masks in, in May, despite the fact that the epidemic started in, in, um, in December. November. So, yeah. yeah, November. So, so um, you know, and issues around washing your hands, you know, physical distancing was always a, a criteria. So you have to keep on changing tack 
as, as the data arrives. So you have to be nimble and you have to, um, you know, realize that uh, everybody is an expert or, and everybody isn't an expert uh, yeah. when it comes to this, this epidemic. So th I think my most pressing question is probably the same for everybody, right? It's because there seems to be these like conversations about when things could look like semi-normal again or when a vaccine essentially will be created and, and there's the thinking and I, I'd imagine you, your evidence working with HIV AIDS is, is not as simple as what you think. It takes a very long time to find these solutions. There are some like Aspen has, I don't, I don't even know what it's called, I have to read it actually. Dexamethasone, yeah, yeah the one, dexamethasone, yeah. yeah. Dexamethadone, yeah, yeah, if you say it I yeah. can repeat it but um, <laughs> So, I mean, what are your thoughts? Because we're all trying to plan. I think the, the challenge that I see personally for me is that I like to world and look, like to live in a world of certainty. So I know what's certain coming forward and then I can plan around that. And I think that's probably been the hardest thing for me. I mean, media has been disrupted as an industry for many years. So that's a little bit uncertain. And now you have this fact that, do you bring the team back, don't you? Do we scale up and get ready for economy or do we carry on waiting and, you, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think it's difficult. So I guess we all thought, um, so in March, we kind of thought um, you, you, you have a surge, you know, we saw those little, those, yeah. those curves, epidemic a peak and you, you, you have the surge and then it goes down and then we all get on with our lives. And um, so that was the, the current thinking, you know, we, we, we had the Wuhan experience that, you know, they, they managed to contain it with those extreme uh, measures of lockdown. And so everybody goes into lockdown thinking, okay, then we're going to have a little peak and then we're going to get on with our lives. And then data starts to emerge and mostly from the United States is that you, you have your peak and then you, you just keep on going and um, it doesn't get better. So if you look at the United States, you know, they've had, they, they're having 23,000 infections a day after having the worst peak and they have the biggest epidemic. And over time, it just hasn't got better. Every day you read, um, the, the epidemic is surging. And so what you see is what we thought was, um, what we, we thought we would all go into lockdown for six weeks and we'd come out on the other side and it would be business as usual. And then, we, then you start to understand that these coronavirus epidemics, uh, they last two or three seasons. And so this virus is gonna, um, is gonna circulate at a global mm -hmm. level for, for two or three seasons, which means that we're looking at um, end of next year uh, to being in a situation where um, we may be normal again. And so what you have to, holiday. yeah. And so what you need, you know, so we either wait until the, the, the coronavirus epidemic uh, circulates out or we try and um, innovate, and that's where vaccines come in. And normally vaccines take 10, 10 years to develop, and now we're trying to concentrate 10 mm. years into eight months so you can get a vaccine out into, into humans so that in, in, in six months' time we'll have a vaccine. So that's how innovate, and, and that's what's maybe beautiful about science and, um, and industry. You can say, yeah. okay, how do we take 10 years and make it eight months? You know, and that's just you know, miraculous in a way. So that's why science is so exciting because people then say, okay, let's do everything. Well, let's take risk and do everything together. So we're not going to go, let's do this experiment or then that experiment or then that experiment. You know, we, you're doing all the experiments at the same time so that you can get into, into humans as quickly as possible. And that's how you, that's what this, this epidemic has, is making us do, uh, rethinking stuff. Yeah, so just rethink, rethink our timelines. Uh, even, you know, I don't know about you, but even since lockdown, you know, when we, when we went into lockdown, I kind of thought, okay, this is one epidemic I'm going to sit through, I'm going to watch from the side. I thought, okay, I'm going to write my papers. I'm gonna, you know, I've got a whole lot of journal. I've got a lot of science to write. I'm going to sit there. I'm going to watch this epidemic art on the side. I'm not getting involved. And then all my colleagues, no, you know, and then, and then I, you know, I kind of was, was thrown into this epidemic. Um, I wasn't going to get involved. I had set up all my teams. They were going to respond, blah, blah, blah. I was just going to have a nice six weeks in, in, um, in self-isolation. And um, 
you know, the rest is history. I kind of uh, got involved. Uh, my, my comrades from the past called me and they said, Glenda, this is, um, this is the epidemic we've been waiting all our life for. This is the epidemic um, that we've been trained for. You know, you've spent you know, all your life working on the HIV epidemic. This is, this is our show. This is, we have to be present. Mm -hmm. And so um, I kind of got involved in a whole lot of initiatives. Um, we wrote a couple of uh, projects, even before the epide epidemic started in South Africa, we predicted what we needed, ventilators, oxygen, this, this, that, um, as well as a science ag agenda around, around um, we needed um, tests, we needed surveillance, we needed uh, therapies, we needed vaccines, you know, and we started to, to mobilize resources. To, to get us ready to respond to the epidemic in South Africa. And so before mm -hmm. I knew it, um, I was working 24 seven, um, you know, uh, being a scientist as well as getting myself into trouble for, um, for being obnoxious. But I mean, is that not a compliment in a way that, um, I, I think a couple of things. I remember when it happened on that weekend, I, I, I said to Fiona, we must write our letter of support to you but by the monday you'd had so many letters it, it didn't seem relevant anymore help still. <laughs> it would help. Business, having it was big thought. business behind me <laughs> but, I think, but i think that wow the response was really great and i think that um you know it it, it probably showed that um it wasn't really so much if you were right or wrong um, I think it was the way that you were attacked in all fairness. And I think it was done in a bullyist way, not in a conversation. And I think that what I think, and I think that's the, the challenge that we're facing is that everybody's working hard. They're all under pressure. Their logical brains are probably leaving them because they're probably a little bit worn out and frustrated and anxious and all those sorts of things. But it still doesn't stop the fact that we must be able to question each other. That's part of a healthy society to question one another. I mean, you said it before, just reading the interview you did, you did in 2017. You, you talked about failure being the heartbeat of science, because if you're not used to failure, and that's it, isn't it? it, it it's if, you don't know, if you know the answer, then don't do the experiment. You know? And so we do these experiments because we don't know the, the results. And so we have to be prepared uh, for any outcome, as long as the way we design our studies are robust enough to give us a, a definitive answer. So yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think that that the crime, the punishment must always fit the crime. And um, mm. when you do criticize um, the government, you know, whether I was right or wrong, uh, you don't, um, you, you have to respond in a way that's measured and thoughtful and, um, and not try and uh, suspend someone or investigate someone or shut them down and mm. um, you know you you know you instead of using a bazooka you can use a caterpillar you know, <laughs> catapult, you, know you don't have to you know a catapult you don't have to um, you know or a pellet gun you don't have to uh, you don't have to use a nuclear bomb to get rid no. of someone you can just you know so whack them you know whack them with a, a catapult you know so I think for me it was around the that that um, it is such a, such a, do we have such a patriarchal society um, mm. that uh, any, you know, if you're this, if you, if you just, if you, if you're um, asking questions, um, you know, in this patriarchal society, how dare you ask questions of authority and, um, you know, the authority knows best and, you know, know your place in, in the world. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I look at the humans, and I look at our behavior and some of the things, and I, I did a podcast with a guy who fell off a boat and he was out at sea about 100 miles um, in, off Indonesia. And the, in the middle of the night, he actually had seasickness from eating some bad food. And he survived for 28 and a half hours. And so I think there's a whole book written about him and how he survived and the mental and the physical. And I think... Tim Noakes said, you know, scientifically, you shouldn't have been able to survive more than sort of 15 hours. Yeah. And, and for me, that's the most beautiful thing about both science and humans is that we surprise ourselves. <laughs> we sometimes beat our own science. And so, you know, I, I, I looked at you when you were talking and I thought to myself, this is almost like another Tim Noakes. This is someone going against the grain. 
but I think it's a great thing. I am more inspired by someone who's putting themselves out there and challenging the status quo because I think it's needed. And I think it's a healthy society when we do that as well. Yeah, I think that we, you know, the freedom of expression and the right to, to, um, to ask certain questions is important. That, you know, we need a vibrant democracy. And uh, you know, our democracy um, becomes dead when you can't speak out. And we've seen, you know, we've seen a lot of silencing, you know, in the health sector. There's people are afraid to speak out. You know, you hear in the Eastern Cape, um, doctors talking about the conditions in, in labor ward, in the maternity section. And, you know, they, they, they are they're scared to be named. And yet they are um, talking about being literally abandoned, you know, by um, other healthcare workers as they try and uh, look after, after a woman. You hear about doctors telling us that oxygen has been run out and they, they don't want to be named because they're scared they're going to lose their jobs. And if you live in a, in a society where a doctor only talks um, without a name because they, they're scared that they're going to be um, suspended, you know, what, what should be happening is that um, the health, the, the, the government should be horrified um, that there is no oxygen and they should be horrified that their doctors are working without, they, the, the doctors are mopping the floors. And mm. instead of, um, you know, being scared to, to, talk, to talk out, that, you know, the government should rush to those hospitals and, and fix them and thank um, the doctors for, for raising the, the alarm bell. And, mm. and so that does distress me that um, you, are, you can't talk out about the, the, the terrible things that are happening in the health sector because you're scared that you may lose your job or you might be suspended. Um, we just saw recently um, a, a, a doctor being suspended in, in Clarksdorf Hospital, Sepong Hospital, uh, Professor Brahmi Veriava, and he, he got suspended because he, you know, he, he essentially spoke out and luckily um, we could galvanize a, a, um, a, a massive support just, just like what happened with me and that mm. resulted in him having his suspension lifted and he's back at work today. And so, um, you know, we're the lucky ones because we were, we're the lucky ones who, who got support, but there's a whole lot of silent healthcare workers, there's a whole lot of doctors and nurses who are suspended, who, who don't um, have the kind of support that, that we had and we have to now speak out for them. You know, we have to galvanize resources to speak out for, for those people who, um, um, without, you know, in, a, in an unjust way, got suspended. I mean, in some ways, I have this feeling that in, in my own personal circumstances, I'm fairly healthy, or I think I'm fairly healthy. I'd rather have the corona, like a friend of mine had it, and I was thinking to myself, well, maybe I should have just gone around his house and said hello and, and got it, so then it's done. And then, but am I being too flippant? Have I been... How old are bit. you? <laughs> How old are you? Thanks for asking. Um, 45. But I'm healthy. But, yeah. But so, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, a lot of people feel that way. You know, can we just get it over and done with so we can get, get on with our lives? And, and you know, the, the, the vast majority of people will be asymptomatic. And mm. so, we, you know, between 50 and 70% of people who get um, SARS-CoV-2 will be asymptomatic. And we know that of, we know who will be symptomatic. It'll be the, the elderly and the people with comorbidities. And so, um, uh, and so you have to have a much more uh, pragmatic approach to how you manage the, the virus. So it's safe to send your kids to school because we know that they were gonna, they're going to have a very mild disease. And mm -hmm. you know, what, what is the risk of children getting it? It's more the risk of onward propagation to people who are more vulnerable like their grandparents. And so, um, or teachers that have, um, who are elderly or com have comorbidities. And so what you have to do is you have to do, uh, you know, a risk adjusted strategy. You have to say, okay, children are going to be safe. There'll be a few children that will, um, at a global level, that will have, um, you know, um, will have excess uh, morbidity or some mortality. But in the, in the long run, you know, um, we can't keep millions of school children out because um, you know, unfortunately, some of them may have a very few of them, a, you know, a, a rare amount of them will have um, side effects. And so we have to try and be pragmatic. And, mm -hmm. you know, if children are vulnerable or you are concerned about them, then you do need to look after them. 
but for the vast majority of people under 55, mm. they're going to be fine. And if they do have comorbidities, then you have to look after them and they need to take special precaution. So you have to, you have to understand that we need to let people out into society to keep um, the country going and also to support those who can't go out because of their age or their comorbidity. Mm. So you have to do, um, you know, a, a risk assessment. You have to have um, equipoise, you know, so that, that the, the amount of people going out uh, justify the amount of people that are still in isolation and that um, the, the healthy protect the, the vulnerable and healthy go out and, you know, um, create a, an economy for the people that need to stay more isolated. I mean, one of the things I did is I tried to look at so the way I see things is it it's um, um, inflammatory um, of your different um, lungs and those sorts of things. So I looked at all anti-inflammatory solutions like berries and the way you eat and de-stressing because um, cortisol brings on this inflammation. So how do we how do we live a lifestyle instead of just looking at science? What can we do as individuals to take control of our own lives to lessen the effects and exercise and not stressing too much. Do you think there's, there's, do you think it's valid to look at those things as an individual yeah. and, and do your part as well? I mean, the challenge, I suppose, is for people who come from disadvantaged backgrounds because they don't have the capacity to be nourished correctly. And you, in, you talked about poor nourishment as the biggest challenge, because if you're poorly yeah. nourished and, and your body's under stress, you're not coping to have the, the, normal mechanisms to deal with these well you have a lot of i mean so what we're seeing um particularly for in south africa one of the biggest risk factors for for a having a a, a bad outcome is being obese and so the first yeah. thing what we can do is try and increase try and uh um ensure that people that are overweight start to exercise start to reduce their body mass index and start to be more um active so that's important so so if one of the first things we can do is um, uh, send the message out about obesity and making yeah. sure that people try and reduce their their weight. Uh, so that's the, that's the f the first thing. The second thing is to limit your to try and limit your exposure to um, the virus. And so the further you are away from people, the less likely you are to get a massive amount of droplets and mm -hmm. um, exposure. And, and then I, I do agree that, um, you know, it's, as you spoke about the person in, um, this, this, in the water, and, mm. you know, there is a, the, the um, resilience, mental resilience is, is critical uh, for, um, for this um, when, you, when you do have, you know, the, when you do have COVID-19. You know, so you have to be mindful. When you, when you, when you are infected, um, you've got you to know your, your body and you've got to be attuned to how your body is responding to the virus. And in the initial phase, you will have the, the, the kind of the viral associated in, um, flu like symptoms. And then um, afterwards, you have a, a multi organ um, uh, disorder where you have a huge cytokine, what we call a cytokine storm. So, so basically, the virus induces a massive immune response to mm. the infection and um, the cytokine storm is is the 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 um the event that that makes you vulnerable and how do you minimize the cytokine storm it's by using things like dexamethasone um, and also to make sure that you don't have any underlying inflammatory conditions like obesity is a is is a chronic inflammatory state and mm. that can uh, that can you know worsen your outcome so I do believe that uh, you you do have to be mindful and and observe your your body when you when you have the the, the infection, and yeah. to be aware of how you can decompensate and um, and then seek care when you're decompensating, and yeah. um, so it's about mindfulness and also about minimizing your the risks and that is making sure you are more active and ambulatory and you're not you're not putting on weight while you you you're stuck in isolation. So we have all these people who, who, what do they call them? The, the theorists that this was made from a lab. Is there any evidence that that's the case? Is it something that you buy into? Is that, is this no, man-made? 
or is it this was predicted you know so um you know the, we have these epidemics you know and there have been a couple like mers you know there you know these coronavirus infections um uh are predicted and um and you know with with um things like deforestation um you know handling um rare, rare um animals eating uh um you know exotic uh meat uh and exposing yourself to 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 bats and um and animals like that who harbor certain viruses like ebola um and and corona um coronavirus you know these these um uh, pathogens can jump the species barrier and and the, the reservoirs are where they are you know we have to avoid um the reservoirs where these um viruses um are are um are being hosted and you know so uh, these these um pathogens you know um have have ho have reservoirs in 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 animals that we may eat or be exposed to and also we have um you know, because of climatic change, deforestation, there are viruses that jump the species barrier, and um, and and then ex then are uh, make uh, and then obviously cause huge um, infections in in humans. We've seen it with avian bird flu. We've seen it, you know, with with you know in MERS. You know, we so we see this kind of thing happening, and I guess this um, this kind of pathogen uh, could reoccur or something like this. So this you know this is the the first you know, severe coronavirus mm. infection that we've seen. It's very contagious and, um, and, and has high transmissibility. I and mean, look at the global spread. You know, we have mm. what, 10 million today, 10 million people infected uh, with, with SARS-CoV-2 at a, a global million. level half and a half a million dead. dead. Yeah. I mean, has South Africa done well? Has, has South Africa done well? Because the thinking before March, before the lockdown, was wow without informal settlements and people's access to the right hospitals and those sorts of things that south africa's in a world of hurt if if you look at somewhere like china that had been you know had yeah. massive fatality yeah i mean that we you know we have a we had a, our issue is um is how we respond to the medical phase of the epidemic and how robust and resilient our health system is. And we had a fragile, fragmented health system before uh, the beginning of the epidemic. And when we could not fix it in 11 weeks. And, um, and so we, we even, even places like uh, Spain and France and Germany and Britain uh, struggled with this epidemic. The, U the USA has one of the highest death rates at a global level. So if these highly resourced settings were um, were shattered. If their health systems were shattered by this epidemic, how could we expect to come out um, uh, in a better way? And and South Africa is interesting because I mean we do have a fragile health system, and we are we are um, particularly places like the Eastern Cape are reeling under under this, and you know some of the health systems has collapsed. But at another level, we have quite a low case fatality rate which is interesting. So if you have a look at our, our case fatality rate is much less than in the US. And is it because we have a youth bulge, we have much more young people? Or is it because it's too early to say and as the, as the health system becomes unraveled, more and more people will get ill. And um, we, we won't be able to have the kind of health response that we've been able to have at the beginning of the epidemic. And so it's going to be quite, it's going to be quite instructive to see how our case fatality rate changes over time as the as the epidemic unfolds, and so you know, touch wood, uh, at this stage we still have low a low case fatality rate, which is great uh, mm. for South Africa, and I hope it remains like this. Do you do you see a lot of young people taking their you know their careers forward more in like the STEM area? Do you, do you see like science, technology? Is that going to take far more focus because of a virus like this? Do you think we're going to be able to involve far more young women in into this arena now? I hope so. I hope people will see it. I mean, the problem in South Africa is that uh, we we have not invested enough um, resources in science and maths at, at high school. So mm. a lot of capable young kids, um, you know, have been 
disadvantaged by not being able to to um, be schooled in science and and maths and so we have a shortage of of of, of mm -hmm. capable students that that could respond and so that's the first the first problem and the second problem is um, again um, at a university level uh, um, some some of the kids although they are smart uh, the, the the bridge to overcome from school to university is sometimes insurmountable and then obviously there, there are issues of, of of race and class and privilege which make it quite hard for for mm. kids from disadvantaged backgrounds but be, be that as it may um, um, you know we we have to invest in in young scientists that are come from diverse backgrounds and we have to spend that time to to nurture them so we you know in in the Med south african medical research council we spent a lot of time building that early stage investigator building that uh, female black scientist and and investing in in her so that they can become mid-career scientists and science leaders and so we do find there's a, a shortage of um of women in science and a shortage of 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 um, from 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 the cradle to the grave, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. in the as a young scientist, um, you sometimes marry your 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 lab partner, and then you set you you basically allow mm -hmm. them to move forward while you sit at home and have children and cook and allow the, the man to go ahead of you. There's also um, laboratory. You know, there's also um, uh, you know perceptions. Women choose technical work rather than scientific work because. Um, it's easier to manage your work, you know, your work, your life, your work-life balance. You live in a very patriarchal society, so you expect it to set, set, step aside for your for your partner. You expect it to to be the the caregiver, even during lockdown. When we've been talking to mm. our scientists, uh, the, the the women scientists are working doubly hard. You know, they expect it to to clean the house. You know, yeah. cook the food and look after the children, and the male scientist is in his in his, zooming in his study, while the female scientist is 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 you know is is sounds doing like, all the like hard. <laughs> so you know, so you know she's doing the zoom for the kids and do the cooking while I sit nicely and work all day long. You know, and you zoom, yeah, you sit there and zoom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's like harassed, and she's been trying to do everything. So, so that's just the, so it's just the um, and so women take on that that um, burden and and it's expected of them in this kind of society you, so you women you know we just have to like re, we have to recalibrate the way we, we we view women in in the world i think it's been a big wake-up call because we've been talking about gender empowerment and looking at what women bring to the work environment and that a lot of organizations rules and systems were developed around men not women but i think this is really focused what what the real challenge is people can actually now really really see if you're working with a woman then you can see hold a second she's also going to do all these other things you you either ignore or you choose to ignore um and so now it almost seems like now because it is so clear and obvious is this the chance where we can rewrite some of the new rules do you, do you see that do you see uh, this as i would hope so thing? you know i'd hope yeah i'd hope that um that you know, I guess maybe men value themselves more than women, and um, and so we have to we have to re re-engineer the way the way women value themselves and yeah. how they assert themselves in relationships in in the workplace and um, in society, and yeah. um, address some of the the issues that that um, impede women. You know, you know there are a lot of Zooms calls that happen at six o'clock at night, yeah. and you know, so who's going to cook the supper and you know yeah. who's gonna who's gonna make sure the kids have done their homework, and you know how do you distribute uh, the workload, and how do we change the way we do things now that we're all working from home, and so yeah. I guess those are, those are the challenges that face women and face women in in all realms of of, of society and particularly science, um, yeah. and you know and you know science is dominated by men and yeah. and um, and the kind of Scholarly work that you have to do is a lot of after-hours work and a lot of weekend work, and mm. um, which does um, limit your time with your family. Do you see? I mean, you've got two girls and a boy. Do you see a shift in the way that they're organising their lives? Do you do you see it, or is it something you? Yeah, I, my, my girls are very studious and scholastic, and so what you see, mm. you know, there's definitely, you know, definitely they. 
the way they respond more so to, than boys well you know my boy um he's very much um you know he wants to he he must become an astrophysicist and so he's very much um you know looking at uh, how um looking on youtube how to decipher a formula a math formula or some kind of theory and so he, he what he what he does is he just spends his his life on the computer um mm. either looking at science um things or or playing games and so yeah mm. uh, he, he doesn't think about oh uh, must i feed the dogs <laughs> Or have the dogs been fed or have they been out? He doesn't care. He just, you know, he's just like, I'm on this, you know, I'm on this machine and I'm playing games and I forgot that the, the dogs need to be let out or fed. And so they, and whereas a, a, a girl child will, will care about the animals, mm. it'll care about um, helping in the kitchen. And so I did see, you know, if you, you know, you had to kind of drag the boy <laughs> Yeah. Out of out of, from the from the computer yeah. to help in the kitchen, and then they have a long face, and they're all yeah. sulky. Why? And, and yeah, why do I have to do this? Why, I'm busy why, with why? my friends. Five wines. Yeah. So so you know, and so I guess it's just and and maybe we also we we um uh in in some ways we we also endorse that we, yeah. that kind of stereotype behavior. We, we we give we give guys a free pass. We give our sons a free yeah. pass. And yeah. we expect a lot more from our daughters. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's really interesting that you're saying that because there is, I think there is a physiological thing that women have more empathy, you know, you, you, you bear children. So I think there's also some physiological things that it comes more naturally than say for guys. Um, yeah, you're naturally empathic. Um, you know, you, you know, you naturally care about your environment and, and, whether there's food in the fridge. Long-term thinkers as well, I think. Yeah, you know, so you, you are. So I think it's just that it's part of your, I guess, um, your your other, you know, that you've been, what society expects of you. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's a, a, a footprint. Uh, not mm. that it might not be a genetic footprint, but it's a, it's a kind of family and community and societal footprint that's mm. in your... Um, in your brain that you, mm. you you kind of get up to do that kind of role. If you were like the minister of science and technology and your goal was to improve uh, the amount of, I don't know, is it is it about more students or is it, you know, about more outcomes, but how would you get, what, what are some of the things that you would do to drive gender empowerment within the school and university? Because I see in the States that there's already far more women studying than men already. You, see, you can see that you talked about your daughters being studious and it's almost the opposite for guys. We're, we're, we're more, we're, we're definitely less studious. Yeah, I think that you have to start from the beginning. So I think it's how we manage gender in the classroom, how we, how, how we manage maths and science in the lower grades and the higher grades. And so we have to teach in a different way. Um, you know, there's even the way teachers manage gender in a classroom. Girls are always more tentative. Like, I think it's this, and boys are putting their hands up. So it's, it's trying to, um, you know, to, to, to pay attention to, to, to the way teachers teach, um, to also um, teach girls in a way that empowers them to be more assertive. Um, we, need to, we need to address the way we, te we teach math and science um, in, in classrooms. So I think you've got to start from the beginning. So if I was the, the Minister of Science and Technology, first of all, I'd ask for a, a, my budget to be 100 times more than it is. Yeah. So I have I, lots I of money. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, yeah. then, then I would uh, reconfigure the way we teach maths and science at school and, and yeah. reconfigure um, gender dynamics um, in classrooms. And, um, and whether, you know, there's some, some studies suggest that you should teach girls, even though if you have a co ed school, girls. Be better if they taught um, in an all girls classroom, and maybe you need to to separate gender to get the best out of women. Out of well, that's so some of the some of the boys do better in a mixed. Yeah. Um, boys will do better in a mixed group, yeah. but girls do better with girls uh, because mm -hmm. they're not intimidated by by boys. So even in co-ed co-ed schools, there's some people are thinking that you should be teaching girls by themselves, and particularly maybe maths and science. Um, so that they don't get intimidated by by um, by boys, 
And so, so boys always benefit by having girls in the class, but girls don't always benefit by having boys in the class. Mm-hmm. And so, so you need to look at, at, at those kind of dynamics. And then in high school, you also need to make sure that, that you, um, the way you encourage girls is different to the way you encourage boys. So it's a whole, a whole rethinking about mass and science in, in the and schools. And then, and then, you know, making sure that there's good bridging. I mean, I went, I went, I came from a, I went to a government school on the East Rand in, in Boxburg in South. And when I went to medical school, it took me about two years to adjust uh, because I was just so far away, so far um, behind my my peers who went to private schools in Johannesburg. So they they hit the ground running. They they yeah. did well from day one, and I really took two or three years to catch up. And so you have to make sure that you don't, um, it's not stigmatized. Catching up should not be stigmatized. You know, there's a lot of stigmatization around bridging. So I would create, I'd make sure that everybody was bridged. And um, for the clever ones, we could let them do some social science because they could do with developing their emotional quotient. And then for the, for the, for the the kids that come from um, poor backgrounds is is to, to take them through a bridging process that empowers them. And then, um, and then basically confidence? make sure, sorry? Gives them confidence or, you know, because then- confidence, they yeah. yeah. Confidence, you know, you're intimidated if, I mean, there's lots of things. It's, you know, the fact that you don't have food, you don't have data, you don't have, um, you, know, um, you know, computers. You know, there's a whole lot of things that just disadvantage you as a, as a poor kid from a, from a black township. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. you have to address all of those things. And then, um, and then you have to, um, create opportunities for them in, you know, in science afterwards. Make sure there's enough PhD programs, postdoc programs. Have to do a lot of mentoring. So it's a huge investment um, in in science. Uh, and you see this kind of, you know, th- this kind of in in South Korea, in Singapore, uh, Malaysia. You see a whole lot of in India. You see a whole lot of investment in young girls um, mm. in science to try and build that 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 mass that cadre. Of, of girls in science. But I think there must be some evidence around if we had to invest a hundred times more in, in science and tech, that I'm sure the impact would be bigger than the level of investment in possibly other departments or other areas, right? Sure. Because you've got a far more sophisticated society, it's going to lead to far more jobs, you know, already South Africa, if you, if you look, we've got great levels of education in certain areas so if we had to expand that that would make us a hub for investment for it and yeah. science as well because of our low cost of yeah if you ever look at south korea and singapore if you look at south korea after the second world war if you look at singapore uh, malaysia um and what they decided to do so singapore is a very poor country uh, as was south korea south korea was devastated um, by um, you know the the wars that were going on Japan and 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 South Korea, and you you took what they did post war um, and how they invested um, in a, um, a strategy where they they put money into innovation into science and technology, and um, that that catapulted them into a whole different um, trajectory. Yeah. Um, and if and if we had maybe paid the same kind of attention to science and, and technology uh, post um, apartheid, you know, we might be in a different situation, and then we are in, in at this time. We kind of almost disinvested in science and maths in those areas, even nuclear, those sorts of things, right? So that it went backwards instead of forwards. And I mean. We, we talk at the moment, we, we've got some big social issues in South Africa. In fact, Africa has got big social issues. What, what is your feeling about bringing more social compact together, speaking with the different players? Are you seeing that, I mean, in your work, you're, what do you see as some of the solutions that you're seeing on a practical perspective? How do we, how do we bring more equality into South Africa and Africa? We have to, yeah. So I think the, the, the relationship between government and people has to be re, re-engineered. And um, uh, people no don't trust... trust well, I, I think we don't trust, first of all, I think citizens don't trust their government. Mm. Um, you know, people are scared of the government, where the government should be scared of the people. 
you know, so there's a there's a lack of there's a power imbalance, and um, mm -hmm. um, governments should be there to serve the people, and that's mm -hmm. not that's not what's happening. And so, first of all, you need a different relationship between government and its citizens, and yeah. um, government needs to be the servants of the citizens, um, mm -hmm. and we need to change that dynamic. And so that's the first thing, and that will build trust. And so you need a you need a, a country that trusts their government to, to take to make the best choices for them. And yeah. then you need to have dialogue with your government. Sorry? Like Jacinda Arden from, you know, she seems to be a very good example at the moment of just communicating, exactly. even short messages, like two minutes, two and a half minutes, but it's effective, right? Brilliant. Yeah, so you have to have a different a level of, of engagement with your, with your country. Um, mm -hmm. you, need to, you need to empower them to make the right decisions and you need to have discussions about about um, you know what do we invest in? What do we disinvest in? You know, do we need an army? You know, with the cost of an army, could we put that into science and technology? Uh, do we need um, do we need this or don't we? Do we need uh, nuclear energy or do we need something else? And to to start to have that dialogue so that communities help make uh, decisions around difficult things together with their government and develop a whole different social compact. So you can't just expect the citizens to do it when the mm -hmm. government is cold and distant. Um, you know, so you, sorry? How can business help? Because I think we, we do, we put a lot of emphasis on government and like, you know, um, we all have a choice, we can vote, so we can change how government is. And so that's the choice that we have. And I think that's come across from the states certainly at the moment is there's no point in rallying what you do is vote you know but at the moment government i think is one way and business is seeming to be a little bit more wanting to change how do you see businesses helping with this social yeah conflict? so i think in terms of business you know so we have to break down hostility between um business and government as well you know mm. and i guess it's based on on the the issue around capitalism, you know, mm. so there's a, there's a, um, there's this triad, um, you know, labor, mm. business and government, and they always at loggerheads with each other. And so you've got to, first of all, you know, um, break that, you've got to build trust with the, with the trade unions, with the workers, and mm. business then has to work with the government. So, um, and, you know, so business is an important integral part of, of the social compact together with labor. And mm. if, if, and labor and business have to work together for the good of the country and have to take knocks together. And for business, it, it can't always be about profit at all mm. costs. And, you know, maybe we need to see profit in a, profit in a different way. Profit is, 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 um, is the social compact. So how do we define profit? How do mm. we pro define um, uh, bonuses? You know, maybe bonuses are, are the fact that um, you fed uh, um, in by, by creating employment um, and doing this, you you um, boosted the economy of a certain community. So we have to define, um, you know, what what our outcomes are, and yeah. and and you know what how we define impact. So uh, yeah. you know what you know what what would be an impact for a you know what is the social compact that business does? You know how do you recalibrate? Uh, your success how do you build trust with labor how do you and labor uh, make tough decisions that that um that improve the lot of everybody um mm. instead of the lot of, of a few and i mean I, I speak to a lot of people around south africa but i mean what what's your view on on africa generally the, the future what do you see as the future for business and growth and science in africa Africa has to get its act together, and um, you know we 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 have to get our act together, um, and we need to we need to have governments that serve the people, we need to have governments that aren't corrupt, um, we need to have governments that invest in 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 their people, we need to have governments that invest in the whole system, we need to have governments who invest in education, um, and until we do that, um, we Africa is never going to thrive. And you start to see it working, um, and maybe, hopefully, there are going to be success stories, like in Ethiopia. Um, mm. You know, there has to be success stories, but even in Ethiopia, um, you know, um, it's not mandatory for girls to go to high school. 
and um, and you know, and so these there should be non-negotiables. You know, that school should be mandatory for every African child, boy or girl. Um, so that's the first thing we need to do. You that's going to need... create equality just straight away. That you know, education of educating girls to the highest level reduces birth rate and increases the economic performance of the whole country. So you're right. Those are non-negotiables, right? It shouldn't. So, yeah. Girl children should go to school. It's a non-negotiable. It's the, they take it out of poverty. You know, mm. they deserve us. They deserve to get to secondary and secondary, a secondary education. So that, so that's, that's non-negotiable. Vaccines for children are non-negotiable. You know, mm. a health system, you know, the, a health system that works is non-negotiable. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, you know, so, so there are certain things that, 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 that we have to do. We have to get the, the building blocks right. Like a health system like the NHS? I mean, or is that a health system like the NHS that's managed by the private we need sector? A, we need, a, a, you know, we need a, a program that promotes universal health coverage and health excellence. And mm-hmm. we, need a, we need a health system that we can trust. And um, we need we need a, a a program in this country that will give health to everybody at the highest level, and not mm-hmm. going to loot it, yeah. and and um, and not and we're not going to have a feeding frenzy, you know. So sometimes I'm concerned that mm-hmm. um, you know that you create a fund, and mm-hmm. it gets looted, you know. So what we need is that the citizens of this country deserve um, universal health coverage, and they deserve a health system that mm-hmm. that uh, can deliver excellence. And certainly um, in South Africa, we have not done that yet. And mm. we've created a huge inequity between the, the private and public sector. And, and, and that's just nonsense. You know, over the last 20 years, our health system in South Africa has just crashed our public health system. And wh- why is that crash? It's because we have in a cadre deployment, we have uh, um, people who don't understand the health system, running the health system. We have people who don't care. We have mm. looting, supply chain management issues. It's it's just you know the the um the the list is endless, and we we should be not we should not tolerate um mm. any kind of incompetence when it comes to health in our country. For sure, because you don't have to. I mean, I often think of like I think it's Canada. I think it was Canada. All the ministers are all um, qualified professionals in whatever ministry they're administrating. Um. And so that does make a lot of sense to firstly have a competence and some qualifications around what you're doing. It feels like at the moment, sometimes ministers move between ministerials with very little regard for their experience or their know-how. Um, yeah, we need technical experts. You know, we can't have your, just because you just because you voted this person in, this politician, you now need a, a kickback in a job. You know, mm-hmm. so we can't, we have to put, our country first, you know, before our comrades, we have to put our country first, we have to get the best people in to do the job. And we need and we need to demand, um, you know, high quality uh, um, uh, skills, you know, we need that they need to deliver. And, you know, we mm. can't carry on running um, at this kind of pace where um, we're making mistakes all the time, because uh, we haven't got the right people in the right jobs. Yeah, and I think I think that's going to affect things even more into the future. Um, if we talk about the vaccine, when do you think we're going to see something relatively uh, usable? Well, I'm hoping that um, the the three or four programs that we bring into South Africa, we'll have some results by February, March next year. So, um, and you know, and by mid year, we'll know whether they worked. And whether and how fast we can deploy them afterwards. So um, you know, um, we're looking at ahead, a, yeah. it's a long road. You know, there's only a year. So I mean, it sounds like a long road because I'm thinking of businesses, how they're going to operate in this current environment, and how's the economic impact going to mean for everybody? That's I suppose the social uh, environment's going to be tough, right? It's going to be. It's tough. Um, you know, it's um, you know if if. If, the, the, if all the economies of the world have struggled, um, imagine how fragile places like South Africa, India, Brazil, Peru, Venezuela, mm-hmm. Chile, these places are going to be are decimated uh, by, by, by COVID-19. 
And so, um, you know, I, you know, we're going to be, it's going to be build, rebuilding an economy like we had to rebuild post uh, the depression, post the, um, the, the world wars. Um, that, that's the kind of um, tectonic place we find ourselves in. You know, we in a, we in a, um, in a severe depression yeah. at, at this moment in time, um, at a global level, and, and even so much more in in a, in in Africa. And, if, and we complain in South Africa. I'd, I'd hate to, you know, I'm re, I'm reading about what's happening in Zimbabwe and um, you know their struggles. Imagine. So if, if we're suffering in in South Africa, imagine what's happening yeah. in other parts of of, of Africa. For sure. And how do you see things changing if, if we get a vaccine? Or when? When we get a vaccine? Well, What's going to happen mean, from there? Is it, is, because we're still susceptible to another... Are our, are our behaviours changed forever now, do you think? Do you think this is it? This is... The handshake's gone? I think that our behaviour um, is going to be changed for a long time to come. I think you're going to see a lot, a lot more, um, uh, lo a lot less mixing, a lot more isolation, um, a lot more obsession. Westerners wearing masks. Um, you know, would you have worn a mask before March in public? Never. You know, um, I, my my daughter and I were coming back from India just before the lockdown, you and we had masks. India. Yeah. <laughs> and we were embarrassed to wear Same. a mask. Same. We were mortified. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and now we're, we're mortified if we don't have a mask on. So, I mean, you know, so we, we are going to become mask wearers. And, um, and that for me is a, a huge shift. Um, and the, the way we um, shake, the way we wash our hands, we're going to be much more obsessed with, with hand hygiene and, mm -hmm. and social distancing and, and, um, and wearing, you know, we're, we're going to wear a mask at the drop of a hat. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a strange uh, place to be. Uh, the thing I think I'm worried about a little bit is I've got three boys and they, I can see they constantly are wanting, seeking friendships from their old friends. I think they, they, they're they actually looking forward to going back to school. You won't believe it, but it's true. Um, and so how is that going to affect our psychology, motivation, our ability to, you know, deal with stress? The fact that we've got this arm's length to our friends and and people because that often pushes you right to to live and to engage and do you see a big shift as well you know science yeah. wise? i mean i think i see so i see like two things which are quite interesting so i do think first of all that children should be playing because we know that they're not going to be you know that that um they're not at risk and um and they don't pose a risk to each other and so we do need to allow them to play and um, and be with each other, and so I think that's an important thing. And um, um, the the so we do need to make sure that we don't restrict the ability of kids to run around and play because we know that they're not at risk for acquiring yeah. you know when they're not they're not for acquiring bad disease or bad infection. Yeah. So they will get um, infected, but they're going to have a a, a mild um, event. Um, for, for, for adults, I think I see two, two processes. I actually see a lot more connectiveness. So, okay, we, don't, we may not be seeing each other, but mm -hmm. I, I, you know, in, around Zoom, you know, we're connecting so much more with, mm -hmm. with other human beings. And I've never been closer to some of my comrades and colleagues than I have uh, just mm -hmm. over this, this epidemic. And then, so I have, you know, we, ha we have a group of um, friends on WhatsApp um, uh, colleagues of mine who are working in um, in in COVID nineteen, and we're we're talking all the time um, to each other on WhatsApp. You know, we're engaging, uh, we we comforting. You know, we're supporting. So that didn't exist. You know, so at, at one level, um, we we've lost a lot, but we've also gained um, a lot as well, and a mm. lot of connection, which um, is is beautiful as well. We've got we've got our top woman. You know the the conference you attended and spoke at. That, so we've got that happening in October now. But it's going. We're going for a virtual global one where we're trying to impact about ten thousand entrepreneurs. We'd love to invite you. We're going to have our dresses on. We yeah, can party, 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 We can drink without driving. <laughs> <you know? laughs> 
So we'd love to invite you to come and speak and share something. I have my dress on. Yeah, I'm going to get dressed up and and drink and not drive and have fun. Have a bit of fun with like a couple other thousand women for sure. So Sounds amazing. We've got to make we can this dance fun, together, right? and we can dance together. Yeah, for sure. Glenn, it was so great to speak to you, Professor. Um, so, yeah, it was really great to speak to you. Thanks so much for, for all your insights. It was really interesting. Um, I think you're my new role model for being a troublemaker. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, thanks for, for your time. No, it's been a pleasure and uh, good luck and um, stay safe. Stay safe and be well. Yes, I will do. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye.